क्वेश्चन हो जाएगा इसको अभी साइड शो पूछा करंट बिगनिंग हाँ ठीक अभी करेंगे आप आ रहे हैं राइट वी गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द प्रेजेंटेशन ना अवजबिल्लामिन शिफान रजीम बिस्मिल्लामान रखी सो द टॉपिक रेली इज what is new in colorectal and general surgery um i would really like to add one or two things and it's it's my experience what i think is the uh, uh, is the road or tips to success uh, in future life uh, for the trainees uh, and it is really important uh, that we all have a lot of patience during our training there will be lots of of ups and downs uh, there will be a lot of heartaches but we have to keep patient and keep working hard and eventually uh, alhamdulillah everyone will become really good surgeons as long as you put the workload the second thing is uh, the tip to success is develop the basics and what do i mean by the basics the, the basics really are the very initial things that you learn in surgery like for example how you stitch and how you control the bleeding and how you hold the tissues the different types of tissues the, the pediatric tissue is different the 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 uh, adult tissue is different how you handle the tissue is really important and and so you have to really at this stage of your life you have to develop the basics and if you have strong basics you can master any technique any new techniques that are coming through you can master them so so that is the, the the basics to it and try not to expect results in one day don't expect or expect to achieve success in one day it's not going to happen like that it's never happened like that and so you have to over or a very very long period if you want to be a good surgeon or a good doctor I, i'm aware that we have doctors a lot surgeons uh, all of them in the in the participants is i'm talking generally medicine basically how to be a good doctor so um i'll come back to this presentation there have been really remarkable innovations in the field of uh, colorectal and general surgery over the last few years uh, and it is not possible for me to talk about all these developments in one presentation in the next couple of slides i will show you the techniques that i learned as a consultant surgeon uh, not as a trainee uh, during the training i was develop, developing my basics when i became consultant i was free to learn these new techniques and i did and i introduced all these new techniques at the hospital i was working in scotland there are certain techniques i will talk about that i introduced in scotland i was the first surgeon to perform them in scotland and one technique i will talk about that i introduced in the united kingdom i was the first surgeon in the united kingdom to perform that technique and i will be showing you that technique as well so here here is a list a very short list of what i did after becoming a consultant i introduced laparoscopic total extra peritoneal inguinal hernia repair laparoscopic repair of incisional hernias stapled hemorrhoidectomy laparoscopic colorectal surgery i started in 2004 i was a second surgeon in scotland to um, uh, to practice laparoscopic uh, colorectal surgery 
open lateral repair of parastomal hernias introduced in Aberdeen, where I trained laparoscopic ventral rectopexy for rectal prolapse, fistula plug repair of complex anal fistula, permacol repair of complex anal fistula. Single incision laparoscopic colorectal surgery, I'll be showing you a bit of that today. I was the first surgeon in Scotland to perform this in 2012. And then I introduced it in uh, Saudi Arabia, where I was working later on. Transanal hemorrhoidal dearterialization and hemorrhoidopexy, also called THD. Open extra levator abdominal perineal excision of rectum, also called open ELAP, laparoscopic ELAP. Transanal minimally invasive surgery I introduced in Scotland and in the United Kingdom in 2012. <clears throat> So I was at the forefront of these developments when I was in Scotland, and I also introduced these um, techniques in Saudi Arabia, in King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we will introduce these techniques, inshallah, in, in Peshawar. So today I'm just going to talk very briefly about three uh, innovative techniques. And, and these are um, single incision laparoscopic surgery, uh, THD, and TAMIS. So single incision laparoscopic colorectal surgery was developed by Ramsey et al. in 2008. I introduced uh, laparoscopic colorectal surgery in, into my practice in 2004. And after performing over 100 cases of laparoscopic colorectal surgery, I introduced single incision laparoscopic colorectal surgery in Scotland in 2012. So far, I have performed over 250 major uh, laparoscopic colorectal cases and over 20 cases of uh, single incision laparoscopic colorectal surgery. The old fashioned laparoscopic surgery is also called conventional laparoscopic colorectal surgery. So this is one of my patients uh, with complex Crohn's disease who presented with acute on chronic small bowel obstruction. <clears throat> the terminal ileum was stuck in the pelvis and right aleic fossa with contained perforations and abscess formation. A conventional laparoscopic right hemicolectomy was performed. The specimen was retrieved via five centimeter epigastric incision and a site-to-site serosubmucosal uh, ileocolonic anastomosis was performed using 2O control release neurolon. Uh, this is a technique, single layer technique developed in Aberdeen where I trained and this is now practiced worldwide. This is the safest technique in uh, colorectal anastomosis with the lowest possible risk of anastomotic leaks. The patient was discharged on the fourth post-operative day. Now, although conventional uh, laparoscopic surgery is less invasive than open surgery, it requires several incisions for ports and an extraction site. Each site is painful and diminishes the cosmetic appearance it also has the potential for causing bleeding, interfascial hematoma formation, visceral injury, local nerve irritation, and incisional herniation. So, single incision laparoscopic surgery was introduced to address these different issues. It reduces the number of incision and pores through the abdominal wall. It thus provides important clinical advantages, including less post-operative pain, reduction of port site associated morbidity, such as wound infection, bleeding, visceral injury, and port site herniation. It also results in quicker recovery and a shorter hospital stay. 
this uh, uh, photograph is of a gel point port, and this is the port that we use for single incision uh, laparoscopic colorectal surgery. And the company that produces this is called Applied Medical. Moreover, nowadays, uh, patients are keeping abreast with new developments, not so much in Pakistan, but in even in Middle East and United Kingdom, when they were, became aware that I was doing laparoscopic single incision surgery, they would demand single incision laparoscopic surgery rather than laparoscopic surgery. And so we have to keep pace with technology. This is a SILS um, kit. It has self-retaining trocars. You can see the trocars. You, you can use as many trocars. Normally, you would put three trocars, uh, or you can put four trocars if necessary. You have a gel seal. Uh, this purple rounded bit is, is called gel seal. Um, it is um, a very soft tissue through which you can put these uh, trocars. And then you have a wound retractor, which is the white bit. Uh, you introduce that bit inside the wound and then put the, the, the purple bit on top of it to be able to perform this type of surgery. For SILS uh, colectomy, I make a two to three centimeters trans umbilical incision for mobilization, retrieval of specimen, and extra corporeal anastomosis. When I started, uh, seal surgery first. I tried different uh, locations for insertion of port, and eventually uh, I experienced that the trans umbilical incision or port is the best uh, area, and it heals very well. I will show you some photographs of patients within a few weeks of surgery. <clears throat> uh, this is the trans umbilical port site and this is a patient who had uh, lap, uh, SILS uh, right hemicolectomy only two weeks um, uh, when this photograph was taken so only this is two weeks after the surgery and you can see it's already embedding itself into the umbilicus and after six months or something you can hardly see the scar so it's almost like scarless surgery we are talking about <laughs> This is another of my patient who went home on the second post-operative day. He has seals right hemicolectomy. And you can see a two centimeter well healed trans umbilical incision six weeks post-surgery. Now, this is a, a stills um, a video of uh, uh, cells. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because whenever we start to record uh, surgery, especially in the initial stages, and SILS is a difficult technique, it's not an easy technique. Uh, then the picture gets blurred, it's not as clear. And so what I did was I would take photographs and I would that this I compiled by joining them together. And so here we go. So I mark the uh, port site, so make sure that it's not more than three centimeters. Once you made the incision, you put the uh, the port, and and it's already the gel, the the port is uh, uh, the trocars are fixed. You join it, insufflate, do a laparoscopy. The first step, a step is to identify the idiopathic pedicle. You skeletalize the pedicle, and here you see the duodenum deep in the wound. You have to uh, then ligate, whichever energy source you like, you can ligate uh, the IDU polycardical. Uh, the further dissection is cephalide and in front of the duodenum, you go towards the transmesial colon and the right branch of middle colic artery. Here you can see that. Once we have done that, you mobilize the, uh, the lateral mobilization of the, the ascending colon, terminalium, appendix, the hepatic fracture, You 
to go around the hepatic flexor. The last thing you do is to take down the omental detachments. Now the specimen is free. As you take it out uh, through the port, three centimeter port, for extracorporeal anastomosis. Here we used staples uh, TA45 and GIA80, side to side anastomosis. So, in experience hands, SILS allows complex colorectal operations to be performed entirely through the umbilicus or chosen stomacide. In doing so, it results in an essentially scarless abdomen and an almost painless procedure with the potential for an impressively quick recovery. I'm going to go to the second talk. A very brief talk again. Uh, this is regarding transanal minimally invasive surgery or TAMAS. Its primary indication is <coughs> its primary indication is a benign broad based sessile polyp between five and sixteen centimeters in the rectum. including regions like a carpet of sessile polyps. Tamis may also be performed in an early low rectal, low rectal cancer in a medically unfit patient who is unsuitable for radical resection. Here we can see an inadequate management of such polyps. These polyps should be removed completely with clear resection margins on all sides, including the deep surface. How can we achieve this goal? Well, we can achieve this goal by either a radical resection or a local excision. The example of radical resection includes abdominal perineal excision of rectum, which is a massive operation for a benign rectal polyp. It results in a permanent colostomy. Moreover, it is associated with a major with major complications such as urinary and sexual dysfunction. It also is associated with mortality. It is therefore not justified in benign polyps or early rectal cancer and in patients who are unfit for major surgery. Similarly, low anterior section is associated with major morbidity, such as anastomotic leak, and it also has a mortality similar to APR. Intensive care facilities are necessary for major surgery, and these patients have a hospital stay. The recovery is prolonged. Local excision can be achieved by various means, and I'm going to show you a few of these. Colonoscopic resection is often piecemeal. This results in causing difficulty in diagnosis and assessment of resection margins. It is also associated with a high rate of recurrence. It may be marked with disastrous complications such as perforation and bleeding. We can perform transanal excision of these lesions. However, the access is often difficult, above six centimeters. Moreover, the recurrence rate is high and it has poor survival in stage one rectal cancer. Transanal endoscopic microsurgery or TEMS was pioneered in the 1980s 
as an alternative to the above procedures. It certainly provided a superior quality of reception, resulting in decreased local recurrence, and it also improved survival in grade one rectal cancer. However, TEMS has a steep learning curve and a significant upfront cost. It is associated with a long setup and operating time, and the rigid large diameter 40 millimeter rectoscope has resulted in anal dysfunction. So the search for a low cost, readily performed technique for inaccessible rectal polyps continued. To address these issues, Thomas was pioneered by Sam Atala, Matt Albert, and Sergio Larache in 2009. It is a hybrid between and single port laparoscopic surgery. I learned the technique from the trio in 2012, and I was the first surgeon in the United Kingdom to perform this technique. So TAMIS is a low cost alternative to TEMS. Its pliable design and small diameter ensures a safe and atraumatic transanal access it has a shorter setup time and operating time compared to TEMS. It is a painless day case procedure. Apart from gel point path platform, the only other instruments required are graspers, energy device, and needle drivers, which is available in all operation theaters performing laparoscopic surgery. <clears throat> This is the whole gel point path kit with a self retaining trocar, gel seal, and a wound refractor. This is one of my patients um, in King Faisal Specialist Hospital, uh, Jeddah. This is a 45 years old male patient who had laparoscopic left hemicolectomy in some other facility for T3 NO MO adenocarcinoma of descending colon. A year later, he was referred to me with recurrent left-sided colonic cancer. I performed laparoscopic subtotal colectomy on this patient as the patient was young and did not want to have any stomas. During the follow up, a 5.5 by 4 centimeter rectal villus adenoma was detected at 7 centimeters from the anal verge. Tamis procedure was performed for the rectal lesion with clear resection margins, thus avoiding him a permanent stoma. Now this is the photograph of the specimen prior to sending it to the lab. As experience grew with Tamis procedure, TAMIS is now increasingly employed for other indications, such as TAMIS total mesorectal excision, TAMIS completion protectomy, repair of rectal erythrofistory, ligation of rectal dilophoia lesions, and extraction of sigmoid foreign bodies. So I'm going to show you very brief a video uh, first with uh, diathermy hook that I was using at the start when I was learning this, and then I later found out that Lagishore was the best instrument, uh, energy device, which is safer, quicker, and less bloody. So this is the port it is introduced into the anal rectum. Here is insufflated. You can see the polyp there. It was identified and marked one centimeter beyond the <coughs> tumor. This is important. Um, so it is oncological surgery as well as it makes it easier during the dissection, you can identify where you want to be. 
a lot of patience is required because this is like sin surgery inside the rectum in a very confined space. And you can see the hook diathermy being used. So, as I said, it is really important that we have resection clearance, margin clearance, including the deep surface. So, we have to be in the submucosal plane. Patience is really important here um, because you cannot speed things up. It's very, very easy to damage the rectum, have a full thickness perforation or do other damages. You can see the overshooting of the uh, the hook, and this is because um, there's a very confined space to manipulate. Um, it is a single port. The camera person is very, very close to your hands, and so there is no lateral movements whatsoever. It's only forward and backward movements. And at the start, this I think was my second or third case, <coughs> the overshooting becomes a little bit better as you get more experience. So we go around uh, the whole polyp. As you can see, this polyp is quite difficult because it is lying behind uh, one of these rectal folds. And to be honest, it would be very, very difficult by any other procedure uh, to do a section of this type of sessile, broad, very broad sessile polyp. So the specimen is retrieved, hemostasis is checked and secured, and all we have to do now is to, to close the wound. And I've realized as I do more and more of these, that it is not always necessary to close these wounds. So for closing the wound, we use a V-lock suture. And you can imagine this is done in a very, very confined space. So the next video is, is very brief, and this is just to show you the use of Ligasure. You can see uh, there was some wetness on the first uh, video, but here it is almost dry plain. And you can see how big the sessile polyp was when we were removing it. Right before I uh, go to the last uh, video, I uh, request all the attendants to please um, mark your attendance so you can get the, uh, the, the points, the CPC attendance. Yeah. So I'll go to my last presentation. Uh, this last innovative technique I'm going to show is the transanal hemorrhoidal dearterialization and hemorrhoidopexy in the management of hemorrhoids. I presented our data in the 30th anniversary of International Association of Surgeons 
gastroenterologist and oncologist world congress in moscow in september 2018 <clears throat> so hemorrhoids is a, is a common anorectal disorder affecting one in 26 people worldwide the peak incidence of prevalence is between 45 and 65 years of age approximately one third of these patients affected will seek medical advice and about five to ten percent of these patients will not respond to conservative management and will require surgical intervention hemorrhoids can be classified according to their location or degree of prolapse internal hemorrhoids are located above the dentate line and covered by columnar epithelium on the other hand external hemorrhoids are located below the dentate line and covered with the square mass epithelium. Mixed hemorrhoids are internal hemorrhoids and are located both above and below the dentate line. The internal hemorrhoids are further graded according to Golliger's classification into grade one, where the anal cushions bleed but do not prolapse, grade two, where the anal cushions prolapse on straining but reduce spontaneously. Grade three, anal cushions prolapse on straining or exertion and requires manual reduction. And grade four, the prolapse is irreducible and remains out all the time. So the ideal treatment of hemorrhoids should relieve symptoms. It should be easy to perform. It should be painless. It should be a day case. It should have minimal complications. And there should be no major complications reported on any of these techniques. So I'm basically going to be talking about management of grade three and four hemorrhoids. There are a number of procedures you can do for these great hemorrhoids. Number one is external hemorrhoidectomy. It can be by open technique, also called Milligan-Morgan technique, uh, which is performed mostly in the United Kingdom, and a close or Ferguson technique, uh, which is performed mostly in the United States. Number two, you can perform staple external hemorrhoidectomy. And number three, from non external hemorrhoidectomy, and these two <clears throat> include THD and HAL procedure, which are very, very similar uh, with minimal differences. So, the conventional hemorrhoidectomy is considered to be the most effective treatment modality for hemorrhoids with the lowest recurrence rate as compared to the other modalities. Worldwide, the open Milligan-Morgan and closed Ferguson techniques are the most commonly used procedures. However, the main drawbacks of conventional hemorrhoidectomy are marked post-operative pain, delayed or non-healing of the wounds, iatrogenic anal fissures, and the prolonged time of work. In addition, it has the highest complication rate. Some of these devastating complications include anal mutilation, anal stricture and stenosis, and the most troublesome complication that is fecal and flatus incontinence has been reported in two to 12% of these patients. Staple hemorrhoidectomy was pioneered by Longo in 1998 for grade three and grade four hemorrhoids. The main advantage of this procedure is the absence of perineal wound and the reduction of pain as compared to the conventional hemorrhoidectomy. Since the staple line mucosal anastomosis is performed at least three centimeters above the dentate line, where the sensitive receptors are but few. It also results in faster recovery to normal physical activity. However, staple hemorrhoidectomy is 
associated with an increased rate of recurrence and re-intervention. In addition, reports of major life-threatening complications have been reported. These complications include significant rectal bleeding in 1 to 11 percent of patients, rectal rectal vaginal fistulas in 0.2 percent, complete rectal obliteration has been reported in literature. Other complications include retro rectal hematomas, retro pneumoperitoneum, and pneumomediastin, rectal perforation, pelvic sepsis, rectal hematomas leading to intestinal obstruction have also been reported. In, in fact, several deaths have been reported in literature. To address this issue, non external hemorrhoidal surgery was pioneered by Morinaga in 1995. It was modified by Del Monte, who introduced THD. THD is a day case surgery. It can be performed under sedation. It is painless and cost saving procedure. It has a low recurrence rate and can be repeated if necessary. And no major complications have been reported in literature. Uh, this is one of my patients with four degree hemorrhoids before and after THD. Now, this video is an animation video, and I'm sure you will enjoy this very brief video. This is a four degree hemorrhoid. Uh, this is a proctoscope with a Doppler ultrasound scan at the tip with a rounded dark mark and a window for precise uh, needle rotation or ligation of the hemorrhoidal vessels. And we are now aware that there are six hemorrhoidal um, vessels of feeding the hemorrhoidal plexus and not three. And so we have to ligate them all. So the anoscope is introduced. The hemorrhoidal artery is identified. And the artery is ligated twice. The first bite is more superficial. It retracts or pulls the mucosa for use. You can have a deep bite on the second go. The knot is tight. And the hemorrhoid is then pack seat or lifted up, as you can see here. Making sure that we are staying above the dented line. If you are below the dented line, the procedure becomes very painful. So you can see the hemorrhoids being reduced. And this procedure is repeated on all six points. You can confirm the success or failure of the procedure there and then with the same Doppler. And this is the result post operatively. So I think we've got a few minutes. Um, where I can just talk very briefly about uh, our own results in Scotland. The first, when we did our first 100 cases, we um, presented it internationally and we published it in uh, international journals as well. Um, so uh, we had uh, this is a prospective audit on 100 consecutive patients with grade 2, 3, and 4 degree hemorrhoids. Uh, this presentation looks at the success rate and early and late complications of THD. We also um, found out the patient satisfaction with the procedure and was documented. So as you can see, uh, the majority of patients belong to over 40 years age group. Only 17% of patients were younger than 40 years old. The majority of patients were males. 39% of patients were females. The majority of patients belong to uh, ASA grade one and two. A few patients were also in grade three and four. Um, 
the majority of patients belong to grade three and four degree hemorrhoids. We had a few second degree hemorrhoids. These are the patients who were severely symptomatic despite other interventions. And these are some of the interventions these second degree hemorrhoids patients have. Banding, injection steel therapy, and some patients even had hemorrhoidectomies. So the majority of patients had rectal bleeding and prolapse as the main symptoms. Other symptoms included discomfort, discharge, and itching. Uh, these are the results six weeks after surgery. You can see in the red preoperative symptoms and in the green the post-operative symptoms with a marked improvement in all symptoms. And these are symptoms after six months. Majority of patients had the procedure under general anesthesia. Some of these patients in ASA grade three and four underwent surgery under spinal anesthesia. Uh, when you have an experience, the procedure takes almost half an hour, 45 minutes. At the start of the, uh, of the technique, when we were learning it, the procedure took up to 90 minutes. Postoperatively, UBMS to know that only non steroidals or paracetamol will be sufficient. Very rarely uh, we use tramadol or morphine. There were 11 minor early complications. By the six months, only eight patients had minor late complications. The recurrence rate was 13%, and all these recurrences are amenable to a second THD. So these are some of the complications, and you can see these are all minor complications like urinary retention and uh, anal pain and submucosal abscesses treatable with antibiotics and other medications. Uh, the late complications including this 13 recurrences, uh, which all, all of them underwent second procedure. And here is the patient satisfaction score. Only one pa patient in the red uh, did not feel any improvement. 3% patients had mild improvement in symptoms. 5% patient experienced moderate improvement, while the majority, 91% of patients, felt um, marked improvement or cure of symptoms. So TAD uh, is a very safe procedure for advanced hemorrhoids. And as we discussed earlier on, it's the day case surgery. post operative pain score is low. It has high success rate. Residual hemorrhoid rate is low. It can be repeated if necessary. The complication is rate, rate is low and mild. And no serious or fatal complications have been reported in literature. Thank you. I have uh, with me um, uh, Professor Bakar Alamjan and um, Dr. Faraz, who's supposed to be here. Dr. Adil, we have Dr. Adil with us. Uh, who will act as moderators. If you have any questions, you are most welcome to ask. Uh, otherwise, we can have a discussion here in this open door. Uh, Ji, uh, I have first a question uh, from Asadullah Jadun, uh, TMO of Surgical D. Um, he is asking about the criteria used for TAMAS for rectal cancer or polyps. What if there is hepatic mers, etc., as well as locally advanced rectal cancer? So, literally, as I said, as long as it's between um, five and 17 centimeters location. Uh, you can have very wide um, based polyps. There is no limits to how much the diameter could be. Um, and um, for the cancer, uh, as I said uh, during my talk, that nowadays this, when it started, it was limited to the benign polyps, but now 
um, we can perform cancer surgery. Um, and even we can combine uh, laparoscopic abdominal procedure with TAMIS from below. Uh, as we know, uh, in certain patients, especially um, obese male patients who have very narrow pelvis, it is very difficult to do the dissection of the lower one third of the rectum. And if you have uh, uh, cancer in the lower one third of the rectum, then TAMIS from below uh, will help with that. And, and I have no personal experience in that, uh, but that was my next step when I was in the United Kingdom, that we would move on to TAMIS uh, mesorectal excision as well. So uh, sky is the limit for this procedure. And, and believe me, this is one of the techniques that will make a huge difference uh, to how rectal cancer surgery is performed. And the only other thing is uh, uh, the patient with hepatic mass. If the patient is symptomatic uh, from, from rectum, uh, then yes, it can still be performed. And then you can have chemotherapy. Again, it depends on how extensive hepatic mass we are talking about. Uh, and what is the prognosis of the patient? If the patient has got only a, a you know, few weeks to survive, and if the bleeding is not too bad, the symptoms are not too bad, then you don't need to do anything about it. But if the patient has got uh, curable hepatic mass, uh, then yes, you can apply a tennis technique in that pa those patients as well. I hope those um, answers those questions as well. Anything? I just wanted to add that that uh, you are a postgraduate trainee. You must be knowing about what is happening in the world and what is there. It's not necessary because they will be all asking. There are about 124, 120 uh, trainees of uh, first year, second year, third year, and fourth year, and they will be saying that we have not seen the cells. It's simple as that, but they have seen the uh, conventional laparoscopic surgery. So. The sir is um, uh, showing these slides because it's being happening in the world and you can only be asked. It's not necessary in the, when you do your post-graduation, then you will do these things, inshallah. And you will buy because up till now we have not even uh, started the sales. Because everything needs a procedure, needs instruments. And those instruments are not provided here. When you get those instruments, then you start that and you improve that. That was, uh, he was lucky that he was in uh, such a centers in which these things are available. So as I have said that even the sales is not available. The uh, and the scope was there, I saw it in uh, 2003 uh, in uh, London. And uh, then, uh, so now it's the, the new thing has come. So the things are changing day by day, the instruments are coming. So don't think that you are lagging behind. You must have a basic knowledge of all the things that you should be able to say when you have been asked and it's not necessary that you do it. If you can do uh, conventional laparoscopic colorectal surgery, you are also a colorectal surgeon even then. This is not that you are not a colorectal surgeon when you are not uh, able to do in that manner. So uh, learn the thing, improve yourself, and uh, improve one method of which you want to learn and excel in that. If you excel in uh, and, and Atawala is here and he has seen in Shogat Khanam. Or what they used to do in Shogat Khanam? Conventional laparoscopic colorectal surgery. So conventional co laparoscopic colorectal surgery is being done throughout the world. And still at the, this moment when I see that it's not very limited centers which are doing laparoscopic colorectal surgery with cells. I think so there may be some problem with it. This is uh, number one. Number two, there may be problem with getting the instruments. Number three, the learning curve may be very steep to learn these procedures. But if you learn the uh, open colorectal surgery and then you learn the conventional laparoscopic surgery, I think so you will be a very good colorectal surgeon. So I think so don't get depressed when you see these things. This with the passage of time, he is above 50 or 60 in the li long lifetime he has learned this. And you have got a long life, you will also learn these things. So these are the things you must know about because in the world, the new things are coming. In the last uh, uh, two, three years back, when uh, we have put a tox, in the tox we have put the laparoscopic inguinal hernia. Because when it was very difficult for them. Many of the trainees 
and said that we have not seen it. We have not seen laparoscopy. This was four, five years back. But I told them you should be knowing about it because they are seeing the YouTube and uh, learning about that. So you must learn about that. And this, uh, we are thankful to uh, Latif Sahib that he has uh, put. But the one thing uh, which I say that whenever we are doing such, it should be on one topic. If it is on hemorrhoids, we should go through the hemorrhoids and do it uh, on the hemorrhoids. That they should know that it's a miracle Morgan method. This is a, a, a hemorrhoidectomy, stapler hemorrhoidectomy, and then a hemorrhoidectomy in that way. Then, other sales procedure. The sales procedure, we should have explained it a lot. Because, and the instruments which are used for it. Because it's a curve instruments. It's uh, the, the longer instruments. And longer and curved. Longer and curved instruments. And the learning curve is here. So, then we will discuss in these things uh, in detail because it was many things in one lecture. So in many things in one lecture, we cannot cover a lot. But if you have got the questions, we can answer it. I will just uh, say one or two things about uh, uh, Professor Okara and John's comments. Uh, first of all, um, <clears throat> we're not um, taking sides on, on the techniques that we are talking about in surgery. Um, I started with open surgery. And I trained in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, which is one of the best centers you can get anywhere in the world in open techniques. They have their own techniques that are beautiful techniques to see even. Um, so, and, and believe me, when I converted to, to laparoscopic surgery, I missed my open surgery. I still do miss, uh, I, I still do open surgery and I really thoroughly enjoy it when I do it. Uh, but there are indications for laparoscopic surgery, there are indications for open surgery, and there are indications for cell surgery. Now, when we talk about cell surgery, when I started laparoscopic colorectal surgery in, in, in Europe, uh, only 1 to 2 percent of colorectal surgeons were performing laparoscopic colorectal surgery. Then um, the numbers, they, because the training intensified, and the numbers improved. Even now, if you do the survey, I haven't seen the latest results. But the last one I saw a few years ago was 25% of patients of surgeons performing laparoscopic colorectal surgery only. So, so I said at the start of my talk that at this stage of your life, you have to learn the basics, and basics are simple. If you if you develop your basics, all these new techniques and believe me, there's one or two techniques that I actually learned on internet, and then I had uh, experts with me. When I initiated those procedures, I had experts with me, and I then went on to doing it independently and all these things. So, but the important thing is that you have basics. Now, seal surgery uh, is is very advanced surgery. It's very technically demanding, and when I started it, I had done over 100 laparoscopic colorectal surgery to start with, and then I had done uh, the uh, uh, totally extraperitoneal hernia repair, which again is done in a very confined space. So when I was working in a confined space, I was actually already used to working in a confined space. And then I went from SILS to TAMIS because TAMIS is even more difficult to do because you can imagine doing SILS surgery inside the rectum, which is actually even more confined space. So all these things develop slowly. Uh, and I being uh, having special interest in laparoscopic surgery, I was not confining myself only to laparoscopic colorectal surgery, but I was doing all type of laparoscopic general surgery as well. And I knew at the start of my training that each one of these procedures is going to help me with developing the next step. And, and this has been a progressive approach, not learned in one day. And for sales, you don't need the angulated instruments whatsoever. These are the same instrument we use, same straight um, instruments. All we need is just a port. Um, and, and initially, when SIL started, people were using angulated or all sorts of curved instruments. But it, to be honest, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Uh, it is going to be difficult procedure. You need a lot of patience. And your the best your best friend is your camera person. If your camera person is not good, you cannot perform SIL surgery. So you have to have a very good relation with your camera person here. Any, anything else? But, uh, uh, what I have seen is that in the last, it was last 10 years and sales came in. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I have saw it with this angulated instrument. 
And then I got senior to Pakistan. When I was in many of the workshops, then uh, we went abroad. And it vanishes. At that time. But some people are doing it. So many people have not uh, started it. They have not uh, worked in it. And they have not bought this. Why? Does Why have you got uh, this uh, sales in Shokat Khan? I think, I think no, even in Shakat Khanam, they are not doing it. So such a, a reputed institution, they have not adopted it. So there must be something, some problem it in is, this. I will, I will tell you, it's very simple. It's very simple. The answer is very simple. Or either this must be a it uh, is, learning curve. This it, is, it is highly sophisticated surgery. Highly sophisticated surgery. And, you know, when I started, when I started all these new techniques in the UK, I was introducing these every time I was learning something new, I was introduced, I was the first person to do it. And can you imagine, uh, everyone was watching my back for me to make mistakes. And you need a lot of courage, a lot of courage to be able to withstand and, and being a human being, you are going to make a mistake. You will make mistakes. But as long as you are prepared to defend those mistakes and make sure that you learn from those mistakes and not repeat those mistakes. Now, if, if I talk about uh, operative mortality, the majority of operative mortality has got nothing to do with surgery. It's got nothing to do with surgery. A very small percentage, point something percent, the surgeon is directly responsible for that. The majority of patients is the selection. It's the selection that we are talking about. The mortality is because the patient is not fit enough for that type of surgery. Or the patient reserves are stretched to the limit. And when you operate on these patients, they have no reserves left in them. And they, and they collapse and they, they don't do very well. So the main thing is, as I said, even laparoscopic colorectal surgery, when we started, nobody wanted to, to do it. Why? Because it's difficult. You, you, it is, you are going from one mindset to a completely different mindset. Uh, even so much so when we started uh, elab surgery, just changing the position of the patient from, from supine to prone position, it is a challenge. Suddenly everything becomes upside down. But it's where you continue, you persevere, you struggle, but you know this is you are doing this for the best of the patient. And being prepared that people will criticize you, all sorts of criticism will come to, towards you, but you have to have the courage to withstand those. And, the, and this is this is the basically the, the crux of it. Uh, not open surgery is as good as anything. You can still do it. As long as you are safe, uh, surgeon, you realize your limitations. Say, look, that surgery is not for me. There's nothing wrong with that. At the end of the operation, you want a patient who is alive and who is doing well without complications. That is the main thing. These techniques you learn as you go. If you have the capacity, the main thing is you identify whether you have the capacity or not. If you don't have the capacity, you don't need to do these things. But if you have the capacity, develop yourself. There's no harm in it. I think there is, there is one more point to the fact that we were discussing two different procedures and we are comparing two technologies, obviously with different learning curves and different surgeons with different intentions and the willpower to do those surgeries. What we are not taking into account is more technology beyond SILS. SILS in itself is just the same concept of going through a single incision with the same concepts of conventional laparoscopic surgery. We are not taking into consideration that robotic surgery has taken over so much that it can be performed through a single incision. The yeah. robotic surgery can be performed with a bit more precision, with a lesser steeper curve. I mean, the learning curve is a little more easier. It is more conducive for the surgeon to take up something new. And there are limits of indications. The cost of the procedure has limited. Maybe those limitations are why we don't think on grounds when we compare our country with some of the countries in the West. They have access to robotic surgery and they've developed their own indications in particular fields. I mean, for, for instance, in colorectal surgery, you would not be doing a primary uh, right hemi colectomy for the first time on robotic surgery. You have better options. You have conventional laparoscopic surgery or SILS. So I think SILS is now more of an individual decision. And uh, if technology has to overtake the conventional laparoscopic surgery, then we should be deciding whether it should be robotic unless somebody in person is, is inclined towards doing SILS. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. I think you know uh, there is no uh, limit to technology advancements. Uh, we know that in future, who knows? It, uh, we may have something better than even robotic surgery. When I was training, there was no robotic surgery. 
when I became consultant and I developed laparoscopic and cells, robotic surgery came and then I went and trained on it. And when I went to King Faisal, I struggled for them to to develop robotic surgery. And but even with money that they have Saudi Arabia, they were reluctant. And I think they were reluctant because they were not skills available for that because it was initial stages. Um, when I was leaving, we brought a robot to King Faisal. Um, two years before that, I went to a meeting in uh, in China. And there was a team from Indonesia. <laughs> Indonesia is much poorer than Saudi Arabia, who were presenting their first 50 cases of rectal cancer surgery, robotic surgery. And I went back and I told the guys there, I said, we should be ashamed of ourselves because look at Indonesia and look at Saudi Arabia. And then they made concerted efforts and we got robot. And I keep on getting offers even now to go back and develop robotic lapis, uh, collateral surgery in Saudi Arabia. But I think I've burned my boards now. I'm, he I'm here to stay here. So. <laughs> about the, the other part, about the Thames part, the Thames part, uh, there, there was a question from one of the trainees and you answered it. It was, it was very, uh, it explained everything almost your answer. But I would like to point out that there was, there were efforts for the uh, Thames to be used uh, in, in a way that cancer could be treated as well. But then there was a limitation of uh, trying to go for cancers that were mainly T1 with lesser invasion. And the, the question came up about a patient who had meds supposedly in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hepatic meds. And then the answer was mainly focused on the size of the polyp or the size of the lesion. And then like you said that if we have lower uh, cancers, like in the lower third, it's evident that there's very little chance that you, per, you prefer the peritone, peritoneum or you could be developing uh, a pneumoperitoneum because of the perforation that is yet to present. So you sort of combine it with the cells or the laparoscopic conventional laparoscopic surgery so you can complete the excision. It's all about gaining access and I think that uh, as long as you have three or three margins and you have a good workup and if I put myself in a difficult position, I have a patient who is uh, deemed for a T1 resection through the thymus. Uh, and this is sort of a question mm -hmm. to you sir. Mm -hmm that now I'm in the middle of a procedure and I realize that it's actually much more deeper. And I haven't downstaged this patient. He hasn't received any short courses, long course chemotherapies. Now what do I do? Do I abort the procedure? The problem, the problem here in Pakistan is because first of all, we don't have subspecialties. Second, the oncological aspect is not well, very well developed. Um, and the third aspect is the uh, pre-op staging is not well developed. Uh, people may or may not follow the rules that should be there. Before rectal cancer surgery, you have to have certain criteria. You have to have MDTs. We don't have MDTs. Uh, we recently started MDTs. So all these things do matter. Yes, if you find yourself in difficulty, never, never let your ego override your decisions. Abort, come out, go in again. Uh, plan it better. If if you have missed planning, if your planning hasn't been good, we are all human beings, we make mistakes, come out, abort. Don't do any damages because if you keep on persevering with that dissection and you are in the middle of dissection and then you find yourself that it is not resectable and you have done the damage because you have gone into the cancer and the, when the cancer starts to bleed, there's very little you can do when about it. When he has decided that he has to do it, there must it can't be a, a irresistible tumor. It must be G1 and stage 1 disease. So if you don't want a board, so you can go ahead and open and do the, uh, remove the tumor? No, he was talking about, I think the the proper conventional surgery yeah. you're talking about. The tennis is separate, separate issue. For Tamis, you have to do all those staging that we talked about. This, what is, uh, the, what, what, that's the one thing. For that. The second thing, the second <coughs> thing is now there is no limitation of T stage in Tamis. Yeah. Because when the Tamis, we are talking about the Tamis, the Tamis is talking about mesorectal excision. So we are going just exactly the same way, same way as, as we go from laparoscopic, but now we are going from below, yeah. making our life easier 
because once you get a bit of experience in that meso rental planes, it's very, very simple as compared to when you're doing from the top. As you can see, sometimes we don't have those instruments, the right curve that undergoes, you know, when the rectum and or rectum curve goes forward, then we don't have those instruments to deal with those areas. And those are the difficult areas where Thomas is taking over basically. So, sir, I have a question. Like, we are very specialized definitely, and we are specialized in the patient as well. So, one is best perhaps I can develop the things, you know, and Thomas, uh, for rectal cancer, for very early rectal cancer, we can do local exit. And Thomas, we can apply to the trans NLTM when you are going, uh, you know, uh, bottom of the rectal. So, for local exit, you, you should have T1, T1, and low risk tumor. And there is no hospital involvement, and it should be well differentiated, and it should be an upper to middle rectum. You know, when it's uh, in the first five centimeters, when you can't, you know, just put your port there. Yeah. So then you can't operate when it's very low down. Correct. The so port should be in the middle and upper right. Yes. So, so you should have access via this uh, port. I think that, that, that would be part. this argument would be sort of a uh, difference between the errors that we're working in and there's a difference in evidence of literature. So like Sir said, Sir is sort of suggesting that no, there are no limitations. Like what you're saying is exactly what we did. We were going through our yeah, yeah, post graduation. Yeah. We had the same concepts. Sense, yeah. But now those limitations are sort of being opened up now. So when you can perform a complete EME, well, like you the said, the point is, No, no, the point is you can't do local exigen for a T2 tumor or nodal disease or high risk tumor. You can't do a local exigen. Yeah. As for the Thomas instance, uh, so suppose the patient has T2 or T3 and one disease, and that is located in the middle, and the patient has a narrow pelvis. And you have difficulty in access to the lower margin of the tumor, then what you can do, you do mobilization, uh, the prosthetically from uh, the outside, and for the lower end, you go through a Thomas approach and resect the lower down because you can see then the lower part of the tumor and you can get a safe margin. So, in that context, you can, uh, you know, uh, use this technique for advanced disease for T2, T3, and T3. So, this is the point. That doesn't mean that you are doing a local exigent for a T2 or T3 